This evening we're going to be looking again at Psalm 119, uh, where we've reached the uh, fifth section in this psalm. And as long as we continue to break new ground, we'll continue through it. Uh, if we need to, we may uh, jump to other topics to, uh, to break it up. But uh, this evening, I think we will be breaking some fresh ground that uh, has to do also with what we saw this morning. Perhaps, um, well, I've already, I think, mentioned uh, what it is we're going to be looking at. But uh, see, as when I read this, if you can pick out what it is that's uh, perhaps distinctive about this particular section. But let's uh, read, beginning in verse 33, and we'll read through verse 40. The psalmist prays, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness." May the Lord bless His Word to our, our hearing this evening. Now again, last time the, the psalmist was reflecting on his need for personal revival, something actually that, that we all need at all times, personal revival. He prayed that the Lord might renew him in his desire, in his resolve to trust the Lord and to do things His way or to walk in His ways rather than to doubt Him and to walk in his own ways. Now, one thing about revival that I think this section actually points out to us, as well as the previous one that we may have, have missed, but something we do need to remember is that revival is something that the Lord does. Uh, revival is, as I mentioned before, when he renews within us the desire to do what is right, the desire to glorify and honor him. That is something that he alone can do whether it has to do with uh, revival in society, like the Great Awakening was a great revival, or whether it has to do with reviving us in particular, uh, personal revival. It's not something that we can do. You know, in many ways, it's like the new birth, the new birth which our Lord Jesus told Nicodemus was a sovereign act of the Holy Spirit where He raises us from death, where we're completely unable to do anything pleasing to Him, to spiritual life. That is something the Spirit of God does where and when He wills. And He may sometimes do it through preaching. He may sometimes do it when somebody picks up the Bible and reads it, or when a friend witnesses the gospel to them, or perhaps in answer to prayer. That's the way it is with the new birth, but the same thing is true of revival. It's not something that we can make happen. That's kind of a hard lesson to learn because, um, you know, if we really want to see the Lord honored, then we should be seeking after revival, and you can seek after it for quite some time and not see it because the Lord will bring it when and where He wills. But we do know something that is also true about revival. It is something that we are to be seeking continually, something that the Lord would have us to pray for, that His kingdom would come and His will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's something that when it comes to personal revival, thankfully, it's something He often does give, something that He is pleased to give, something He's actually promised to give. Now, I just wanted to note that because I think we see something of that recognition in the psalmist's words in this section this evening, the recognition that this is something that God must do, which is why, of course, He is appealing uh, to Him. Um, again, especially with regard to this topic of revival. When the psalmist began this rather lengthy psalm, he began by speaking about the blessing that actually comes to those who keep the law. 
And he talked about the law as the standard of purity by which the Lord would have us to live. He talked about the fact that we would be persecuted uh, if, if we would dare keep it, especially in a way that others can see it and they can recognize that there is a difference. And in those, those three first sections where he talks about these particular subjects, he only had two requests from God. The first one with regard to purity, as he thought about that the law of God was the only way that a young man could keep his way pure, and certainly anyone could at whatever point in life. He prayed that God would teach him his statutes, his law, his commandments, so that he might be pure. And the second petition came with regard to persecution, that even though keeping the law would bring persecution, that God would open his eyes so that he could see the wonders of the law of God, so that he would see that the persecution that he had to endure for keeping it would actually be worth it. But again, in the first three sections, only two petitions from the Lord, but as he turns his attention to revival, his requests multiply because he realizes that this is something that God must do in his life. Now, in the section that we're looking at this evening, the, the psalmist asks the Lord for no less than nine things that only he can do, and they all have to do with personal revival. As he again examines his life to see what his particular needs are, he calls out to the Lord for renewal, for revival. Now, last time it was his sin in general. He saw the sin in his life. He was humbled by that sin. He confessed his sin. He wept over his sin. He longed to be free from his sin, which is what every Christian desires. And so accordingly, he asked the Lord for particular mercies to revive him according to his word, to teach him his statutes, to make him understand the way of his precepts, to strengthen him according to his word, to remove the false way from him, and graciously to grant him his law. That's what it means to be revived, to have a renewed zeal to obey the Lord and to walk in His ways. And thankfully, because as I mentioned before, a prayer for personal revival is one which the Lord is pleased to answer because what does the Lord want us to be? I mean, this is what He wants us to be. This is what the apostles prayed for when they had been arrested and put on trial and accused and told not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They gathered back together with the disciples and they called upon God and asked Him for the strength to be able to do what He called them to do. And the Lord answered that prayer and He sent His Spirit and the place where they were was shaken and they were filled with the Spirit of God and began to speak the Word of God with great boldness. In other words, the Lord revived them. And even in the Old Testament here, even in the words of the psalmist, we saw that he understood this is what God was pleased to do in him and that God would answer this prayer because this is what he wants for his children, which is why he ended that section by saying, I shall run in the way of your commandments because you will enlarge my heart. In other words, you'll give me a greater love and zeal for these things so I will not just walk in the ways of the commandments, but I will run in them. Now, the need that he sees this time in his heart is perhaps a little bit more specific, but yet it is general enough to include a large number of things. And I think the thing that is unique about this passage that he is asking for is this, that the Lord would turn his eyes away from looking at vanity or things that are worthless and set his eyes on the things that really do have value. Now, I think that this topic fits very well with what we were looking at this morning. Remember, the author to the Hebrews is reminding us of the importance of faith because faith gives us the ability to see what is most valuable, to see what is most precious, to see what God has promised and to know that those things are real and to welcome those things, to desire those things and to begin to move in that direction. Faith, in other words, draws us up from the earth and from the things of this world and draws us toward heaven, towards the heavenly city, which the psalmist or the author to the Hebrews told us God has prepared for those who love Him. 
those who have faith, those who seek after Him. Now, tonight, the psalmist reminds us that there's another reason why we should turn from the world to heaven, and it's because heaven is precious, but the world is really worthless. So I want us to consider two things through this passage this evening. First of all, what the psalmist was asking the Lord for the strength to turn away from, and secondly, what he was asking the Lord to turn him towards. And again, what we're looking at, basically, is the other side of what we were looking at this morning. This morning, we were looking at the fact we should fix our eyes on heaven and go after that. This gives us another reason to do that because the world is essentially worthless. So first of all, what does the psalmist ask the Lord to turn his eyes away from? Well, this is very practical because it's the same thing that we struggle with. He wanted God to turn his eyes away from vanity, from the empty and worthless things that are in this world, Uh, the things that basically at the end of the day aren't really going to benefit or profit us at all because they don't have any lasting value. You know, if that psalm that I read said anything, it it said that. Basically, it doesn't matter how much of the world's wealth you have. If you don't have God, you have nothing. If you don't have Christ, you're going to lose it all, and you're going to perish in the end, just like the rich man did who um, fared sumptuously, but Lazarus, who was suffering, inherited the kingdom while the rich man was cast into hell. Now, what is it that that he is actually referring to here? Well, he's referring to the same thing that John Bunyan was referring to in his book, Pilgrim's Progress. Again, a book on the world, a book on the Christian life, and how we are to navigate through this world to heaven. John Bunyan gave us a very vivid description of the vanity of the world in that fair in the town of Vanity, which was called Vanity Fair. Uh, The fair, as you remember, was a place where vendors would sell their merchandise, and the town was called Vanity because Bunyan told us, all that is sold there, as well as those who come to buy, is vanity. As is the saying of the wise man, all that this world promotes is vanity. If we don't get anything else this evening, we need to get that one point. Everything in the world outside of God's kingdom and His will and what we do for Him is essentially worthless. Now, what exactly were they selling in Vanity Fair that was so worthless? Well, things that sometimes we place a great deal of value on. This is what Bunyan wrote, every type of merchandise was sold, including houses, lands, trades, places, honors, promotions, titles, countries, kingdoms lusts and pleasures. There were also delights of all sorts, such as prostitutes, madams, wives, husbands, children, masters, servants, lives, blood, bodies, souls, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones, and much more. And moreover at this fair, there is the constant entertainment of jugglers, cheats, games, plays, clowns, mimics, tricksters, rogues, and many other amusements. Here also are to be found a number of free offerings, including thefts, murders, adulteries, perjurers, all available in various shades of blood." (laughs) Quite a description. Now, what is it that Bunyan is referring to here? Well, he's talking about the world in which we live, at least the world considered from one perspective. It was the world of his day, but we need to realize it's also the world in which we live. Now, was there any way that this could be avoided? Well, Bunyan says, no. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, every believer has to go through it. He says this, now, as I said, the way to the celestial city runs directly through this town with its lusty fare. And he who would go to that city and yet not pass through this town must necessarily go out of the world. And the reason why you would have to go out of the world is because this is the world that he's referring to. We have to go through it, and so we have to learn how to deal with it. But how are we to deal with it? Well, we are to deal with it, Bunyan would tell us, in the same way 
that Jesus did. Remember, Jesus is our example in everything. He says this, the prince of princes himself, while traveling in this region, passed through this town when heading toward his own country. And at a time when the fair was in full operation, yes, and I believe it was Beelzebub, the chief lord of this fair, who personally invited him to buy some of his vanities. Yes, he would have even made him a lord of this fair if only the prince had bowed to his overall authority while passing through the town. Further, because he was such a person of honor, Beelzebub escorted him from street to street and showed him in a short space of time all the kingdoms of the world so that he might lure the blessed one to lower himself and buy some of his vanities. But this stranger had no desire whatsoever for this merchandise, and therefore he departed from the town without spending so much as one cent on these worthless goods. This is the way we are to deal with it as Jesus dealt with it. Now, we need to back up for a minute and ask this question. Is Bunyan telling us that everything in the world is essentially worthless? Well, yes and no. Okay, there are things that are here that are always worthless. I don't know if you notice, but Bunyan actually mixed some things we would consider to be good things in with things that we would all agree are bad things. I mean, there were husbands and wives and children. Those are good things. But there were harlots and madams and uh, all types of lusts and pleasures and things like that that I believe we would all agree are bad things. So there are things that are always worthless. Sin, which as we saw this morning... Um, well, in the case of Moses, he recognized that sin might bring pleasure for a while, but that pleasure soon passes and brings only pain because eventually we have to face God for committing it. Certainly, all the sin that is in this world is absolutely worthless. But the thing that Bunyan would, I think, draw our attention to is that things that may not necessarily be sinful in and of themselves can still be worthless depending on how you use them. For instance, you know, possessions aren't bad in and of themselves. Bunyan included houses, lands, silver, gold, pearls, precious stones. Those things aren't essentially evil. Neither are positions in this world. The um, honors, promotions, the titles, the kingdoms that he mentioned, nor relations that the Lord may give us, husbands and wives and children. And recreations aren't necessarily that. Now, the Lord has given us these things. All these things are actually a gift from His hand. Uh, James tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of lights. But we need to remember why He has given us these things. He has given them to us, one, to provide for our needs, two, to be a blessing to us, I believe. But He's also given them to us for another purpose, which if we miss can make these things become worthless, and that is He has given them to us to glorify Him. If we receive these things and simply enjoy them for what they are, and if we take what the Lord provides for us and we basically use them purely for ourselves, in the end, they're all going to be worthless. In other words, we're going to take what is precious and reduce it to ashes, to straw, to wood, hay, and stubble. But on the other hand, if you use these things in the way that the Lord intends and the reason why He gave them to you for His glory, if you invest these things in the kingdom of heaven and use them to further His purposes in this world, then they become valuable. So Bunyan didn't see these things as being worthless in and of themselves or, or essentially evil, not everything that was in Vanity Fair. But it's only when these things become an end in themselves and we don't use them for the glory of God. I think a good example we're actually going to see in our uh, next movie night as we consider chariots of fire, uh, we see that difference in the way that Eric Little used his athletic abilities in order to serve the Lord and how most other athletes use their abilities. Uh, Eric ran, as was the movie, I think at least in some way portrays, for God's glory. He said when he ran, he felt the Lord's pleasure. 
And uh, when he was praised for that ability, when that ability or his running actually brought attention in his direction, when he won the races, he didn't just sit there and bask in the glory of what he had just accomplished and just sort of take it all in, as many athletes would do. But instead, he used that attention and that opportunity to preach the gospel. Hopefully a better message than we see in the movie, but he preached the kingdom of heaven and how one might enter it through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what Eric Little was doing then with his abilities and with the, the, the fame that was coming his way was he was converting it into gold, basically, or things that he might be able to keep forever in heaven, whereas the others who just simply bask in the glory themselves are pouring everything they might have gained down the drain along with their souls. Now, as I mentioned before, the only thing that you and I are going to be able to carry out of this world, the only thing is what you actually give to God. So what you give to Him of the things He gives you is, is by using the things He has given you for the reasons that He has given them for, you know, to you. Certainly, as I mentioned before, to be a blessing to you and to take care of your needs, but also to invest in His kingdom. Uh, if we just take all these things and we spend them on our own pleasures, that is going to be the end of it. It's gone forever. But if you invest it in the kingdom of heaven, if you invest your time, if you invest your talents, the Lord says He will reward you and you will be able to enjoy those things forever. Now, as I mentioned before, on the day of judgment, this is the only thing that is going to matter. The fact, of course, that you've trusted in the Lord, but how have you used the things He has given to you? How well have you obeyed Him, the one who entrusted all of these things to you, as a specific stewardship given to you to use these things for Him? I don't know if you realize it, but that's what the commandments are really all about. Uh, showing you how to use the stewardship the Lord has entrusted to you for God's glory so that you can receive a reward. Now, that's what it's all about. So, not surprisingly, the psalmist is, is asking the Lord to turn his gaze away from that which would ensnare most of the people in the world, the vanities of this life, and to get them fixed on the things that are really important. That is, that the Lord would help him to obey. Again, the psalmist is praying for personal revival, that the Lord would renew him in his understanding and in his desire to do God's will, that he might be a faithful steward over what the Lord has given to him and that he wouldn't pursue the things of the world which essentially are worthless. Again, consider the greatest accomplishments that have ever been made in this world, the greatest athletic accomplishments, perhaps the greatest, you know, acting, the greatest writings, uh, the greatest of anything you can think of that was all done purely for the own person, that person's self-interest, all of that will mean nothing on the day of judgment because it wasn't done for God's glory. The only things that will matter are the things done for Him. The, the psalmist understood that, which is why then he turns his attention to the Lord and prays what he prays. And again, we're, we're not going to go through all of these things because I think it's essentially a repeat of what he's already asked, but let me just read it again in that light, and perhaps you can sense something of the heart of the psalmist because this is what he wants you and me to seek as well. He says, "'Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes.'" And I shall observe it to the end, to the end of his life. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. You see, that's a petition as well, not only to understand it, but to keep it from the heart and with the whole heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it, even though we delight in these things because God has given us His Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be doing what we should be doing. We need to pray for God's strength 
to be able to do it, not just to desire it and delight in it, but actually to do it. He says, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain, which is a part of those vanities of the world. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity, at things that are worthless, and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you, which is the fear of the Lord. It turns us away from evil and turns us into the path of righteousness. He says, turn away my reproach, which I dread, which I think is the reproach with which he would reproach himself for being unfaithful to God's word. For your ordinances are good. In other words, another way of saying, establish me in your ways. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. Now, you see, when all is said and done, this is really all that matters. Obedience to the Lord. That is the purpose behind redemption, remember. The reason why God sent His Son into the world was not just so that you wouldn't have to go to hell and you would go to heaven, although that's certainly part of it and part for which we're very thankful, but it was also to turn us away from the path we were going and to get us to walk in the right path so that we would be living testimonies, epistles read by all men, that we would be obedient children, that we would be like Christ. Remember, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch because when the people saw them, they saw Christ living in them. They were living epistles. That's what the Lord wants us to be. So when everything, as I said, is all said and done in this world, this is all that matters. As a matter of fact, again, this is what the Old Testament says as well as the New Testament. The wisest man who ever lived, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, concludes his book on life, which is the book of Ecclesiastes, after surveying everything that this world has to offer and concluding that it's really all vanity, it's all worthless, and really he was able to enjoy the most that anyone can possibly enjoy out of this world. This was his, his concluding words. He says, the conclusion, when all has been heard is, fear God and keep His commandments, because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Now, I should mention, thankfully, that when you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the bad things you've done, all the sin, all the evil is blotted out, and you will be presented blameless before the Lord on that day, and the only thing that you will be examined for are the good things that you've done or the worthless things that you've done, as uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, but not the sinful things that you have done. But if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, then every single sinful thing that you've ever done will be examined and weighed, and you will be judged accordingly, which is why you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to have your sins blotted out. But having trusted in Him, the only thing that matters when everything has been heard is fear God and keep His commandments. This applies to every person. But how can you do that? You can only do it by God's grace, which is what the psalmist recognized, which is why he was praying to God and asking Him for all these things. Pray that God would revive your heart. Pray that He would constantly revive it and open your eyes so that you would see what it is that really matters in this life. It's not the things of the world. Again, Jesus said you can gain the whole world but lose your soul. How valuable is the world? It's not valuable at all. What is valuable is Jesus Christ, trusting in Him, turning from your sins, following Him. Pray that He would open your eyes to see that so that you would use your lives for that which really matters, that you would turn away from vanity and pursue those true riches which are in heaven. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's um, bow in a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us remember uh, that this is what life is all about and to move us in the right direction. Let's, again, let's pray.